everything. Like I said, it might ask you guys to accept, so please go ahead and accept the recording, but as of right now, we are recording. So welcome everybody to our EVMTA meeting. Um, I am not Dr. Peterson, as most of you probably know, but uh, we're really grateful to uh, Elias Peterson for letting us use his paid Zoom account so that we don't get kicked off after 45 minutes. So that is why it's calling me Dr. Peterson. I'm Carolee Hunter. If any of you don't know me, I'm the um, second vice president for EVMTA and our president, Redmila, and our vice president, Jessica, are unable to be here this morning because of their university duties. So, uh, so I'm taking over. Um, so there's just a few announcements before we start, and then I'm going to let anybody, um, if, if anybody has announcements from the board, that need to be done or any new members that would like to introduce themselves, then I'll leave a little bit of time for that. So if you're on the board and you have something that needs to be said, um, I will get to you in just a moment and, and we'll do that. So um, our next, uh, next big exciting event is we have a master class with Dr. Sylvan Neg Neg Negrutitu. Oh, I'm darn it. Negrutitu's master class. That's on November 17th, starting at 10 o'clock, just like normal, 10 o'clock to 1130. That is going to be held in person at Hammer and Strings Conservatory. So we're very excited about that. Again, November 17th. And any if you have students that are interested in playing for that master class, um, please email Jessica Yam. Um, it's open to all levels and all repertoire at this point. So just be, be thinking about that. So calls for students. Um, there are, let's see, the music showcase is coming up rather quickly. I believe, um, yes, the, the registration has closed for that, but um, that is happening next Saturday. So I know they're, they're working out the schedules for all of that right now. So be aware of that. And then um, I believe we have one other, oh, I forgot to write that down. One other thing happening soon after that, maybe it's the fall recital. Um, somebody else can fill me in on that. Um, so for our board members, is there anything else that you would like to announce before I go on? Is there anything anybody needs to know? Oh, Shireen, I'm I'm not hearing you. Is everybody is anybody else hearing? Can you hear me now? Ah, yes, there you are. Sorry about that, forgot to turn that on. Um, I said it would be nice to just have the date for the fall recital as well. So, um, yes, let me. I had that in the email, and I. Hmm, try and pull I that think up. It's like around November. Is that November the 19th, maybe? Um, so I just want to double check on that. Pulling that up. Yeah, so, okay. I have the information, I'll just say it. <laughs> oh, thanks, thanks, Shireen. <laughs> You're welcome. So the online registration has already opened. It started from October the 15th and it will close on November 5th. And the recital is going to be on Saturday, November the 19th. And it's got three concert, uh, concert times from 1.30, 3 o'clock, and 4.30 over at Hammer and Strings Conservatory. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you so much on that. Is there any other business from our board members? Or, um, or do we have any new EVMTA members here that would like to introduce themselves? I know you're probably all seeing a lot of unfamiliar names, but um, Natalia let me know that she has some students <laughs> attending this. And so all those new names are not new EVMTA members, unfortunately. So, but if there's any new ones, then welcome, welcome. We're glad you're here. And with that, I think that we will just move on to our class for today. Um, we're so excited to have Natalia Shkoda here. Um, she's been praised for her impressive pianistic range, her brilliant technique and depth of artistic interpretation. 
Um, she has, since presenting her first solo recital and winning a national composer's competition at the age of 13, she has performed over 300 recitals worldwide, appeared with a soloist with Masterwork Symphony, Southwest Symphony, Paradise Symphony Orchestra, and North State Symphony. Her, por her performances have been radio broadcast on three continents. She's a recipient of a presidential scholarship in Ukraine in 1993. Winner of National Young Composers and Journalists Competitions, Masterworks Festival Concerto um, Competition, and Klotzkin Contemporary Music Competitions in Piano and Harpsichord. Um, she holds a doctorate and master's degree in piano performance from ASU, diplomas in piano and musicology and performer certificates from Kharkiv State National University of Arts in Ukraine, and um, diploma with gold medal in piano and composition from Kharkiv Special Music School for Gifted Children in Ukraine. She, her three volume recording, um, Kosenko recording project features first Western recordings of Kosenko 11 etudes in the form of old dances um, to, uh, and the premiere of recordings of his complete piano sonatas with other works. It's really impressive. And today we are thrilled to have her talking to us about piano ensemble and all of the many benefits that this has for us, um, kind of the some resources and just different ways to be creative with piano ensemble. And with that, I will let her take over. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I would like to especially thank Radmila Stajanovic and Jessica Yam and Gary Hunter for helping me to have this presentation, for organizing the event, and for having this wonderful opportunity to share my research and topics that interest me with you and with uh, some of my students. Um, thank you for giving uh, me a wonderful introduction into this and talking about me and why my achievements. I have a co-presenter today with me, and my co-presenter is my daughter and my student, April Smirnov, and she's going to introduce herself. Hi, I'm April Gesmanov. I'm six years old. I started playing piano when I was four years old in 2020. I won, the, uh, I won a couple months piano auditions when I was four in 2020 and passed certificate of merit in 2022 when I was five years old. And can I tell you the what certificate order. of merit is? It's a statewide program. The statewide program in California, which includes exam in five areas, piano, technique, sight, region, theory, and oral skills. So it's a very difficult exam to pass. Um, do you want to say that you are in school now? Yes, I'm a first grader at an Academy of Languages, Arts, and Sciences. I'm homeschooled, too. <laughs> Thank you, April. So we're going to start with... Um, couple of statements and then think about statements and um, we will be asking you questions as we go and because it's interesting to see how things develop for different people. So I started play, playing piano when I was six, six and a half, but it wasn't until I was 19 years old when I played my first piano ensemble piece. And I didn't think much about that fact. Yes, yes, I see Barb's face. Yes, exactly. That, that's exactly what I'm thinking. But, you know, at the time when it happened, you know, you follow your teacher's advice, you do what they think is best for you, you follow the program, you don't question many things in your life, especially when you're a first generation musician like I am. And there is nobody around you who can point you out to, you know, better direction maybe. But uh, eventually when I started teaching, extensively, both group and private piano, I started thinking, was that the right decision? Why was it happening to me? And why it took so long for me to get introduced to piano ensemble music? And uh, to give you absolutely different example, which came after I was thinking about all this, that's my own daughter. When did you start playing piano again? When I was four years old. When did you play your first ensemble piece? When I was four years old. So that's one of the things that I highly recommend to start teaching ensemble music right at the beginning and maybe even before you teach notation and other important skills, because it clearly develops quite a few skills that can be absolutely beneficial for any pianist. So I will, I will probably want to ask you 
um, teachers in Arizona. When did you play your first ensemble piece and when did you start playing piano? If you can remember that, of course, but approximately, like how much time was uh, elapsing between these two events? Started play, starting playing piano and playing first ensemble piece. Anybody? Shereen, do you remember? I do. I started when I was 10 years old. I started to play the piano when I was 10, but I don't think I was exposed to the ensemble until I was in middle school when I played for the choir. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, it was so much fun. <laughs> exactly, which was hiding right because you were not exposed to that but how about specifically piano ensemble piece because i was exposed to ensemble music a little bit earlier still not right away but earlier than to piano music so specifically piano for hands do you remember when was the first time you played i don't know mozart sonata or bizet piece or greek piece or something do you remember that yes i think for me it was in high school so again, a big number of years looks like, right? So situation similar to mine, right? Uh, Barb, how about you? Do you remember? Uh, the same as Shireen. I started playing when I was seven, but I didn't really have uh, an ensemble experience until high school. And that particular teacher was doing... Um, group lessons actually in a in a lab in her home and at the time it was kind of a new thing mm -hmm. um but that was high school and there were four of us um at pianos at the same time it's wonderful excellent um Caroline, how about you yeah i'm i had a little different experience so i started playing piano when i was four mm -hmm. um but i was the youngest of well, I, I had four older siblings that all took piano lessons. And so um, I and I also was a Suzuki piano student. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there was a lot of opportunity to do things with my siblings. And then I attended one or two um, Suzuki institutes and I, uh, playing as a group and is kind of one of their focuses. So I I was introduced to it fairly early, but I will say that the opportunities to do it were were scarce outside of my own siblings. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah, so it definitely helps, in my opinion, to have musicians in the family because you can do things with them. But as I mentioned, I was first generation musician. Uh, nobody took music seriously in my family. Actually, it took me three years to convince my parents that, yes, I do want to play the piano. And they were still waiting that I will drop out of that idea because yeah to buy a piano was a big investment for the family so i just kept saying i want to play piano and they just kept saying well let's wait until you really want to play the piano so at some point i really wanted to play the piano and they were forced to buy it so um but you know everybody has a different story but i think it's quite typical for um you know my generation and um especially for the culture i come from you know former soviet union when you went to school there and started pursuing music, they would look at you as a soloist in the first place, and they would do everything possible to develop you as a great soloist. So they would work on your technique extensively. They would give you a lot of assignments to develop your fingers, to make them strong, to make them flexible, to make them anything you want to make out of them. Uh, you would need to learn very difficult pieces from the very early age, regardless of how much power you have and how you build physically, if you really fit in that particular profile, they would not really care much about this. You had to show your strength and determination and survive all of those tests to become that, you know, very, very good performer, because otherwise, uh, you just don't have to be in that area. So it was always, you know, just competing with yourself, you know, for a very long time. But I think the education was really just, you know, centered around becoming a concert pianist, even though only very, very few people actually became the concert pianist after all these years of this very, very difficult uh, and time consuming and energy consuming education. And then, of course, you know, uh, there was no way to talk about uh, how you feel while you were studying 
and putting so much effort into studying because all this emotional things that people were dealing with and they were dealing with emotional things but uh, you would not have any support you know your teachers would not discuss any emotional or mental or otherwise issues while you were studying for your degree because if you're only interested in basically making a very very good robot who can play piano really really well you know and survive all hardship and just still stay on top of everything regardless of what else was happening in the life but again as i said at the time when you know i was doing that i didn't know any of this i didn't have any musicians who would tell me about this i didn't have any uh, teachers at that time who would share their experiences and maybe their frustrations with me as younger generations it happened later i did start having you know conversations with teachers who were twice as old as me but they were still maybe in their 40s or you know early 50s at that time and i was still a student so they could tell me just a little bit about how things actually work 20 years after you finish the school so i got some insights but not when i was 10 and not when i was 15 and not when I uh, was not introduced to the piano ensemble music. But I think that's really the reason why I myself was not taught that because ensemble music, it develops very different qualities in, uh, in a performer than the soloist, right? And if you need that, you know, very strong soloist that can win all kinds of competitions, all kinds of events, then ensemble music kind of, uh, just uh, takes you away from that direction. It takes time to learn the pieces, but it doesn't develop you in that direction. So that probably was the reason why I was not introduced to that particular set of skills uh, quite, you know, for quite a number of years. But I was just thinking that on subconscious level, there were also things and music that I chose to do because I wanted to do them. And uh, one of them was composition. And I was composing music from very, very beginning, from the moment when I could, you know, realize that I can notate something. And um, interestingly enough, again, looking back, I composed for ensembles. I almost never composed for piano solo. And I think that was done in compensation for just being taught to be the soloist, but because I really missed somehow, subconsciously, I missed being with people and collaborating with people and having projects with people and seeing how piano can be a part of large ensemble. I composed for voice, I composed for woodwind instruments, I composed for violin, I composed choir, for, for the choir in which I could sing as well, but uh, I didn't compose my first solo pieces for piano until I was almost at the end of the school. Cool. So I was 14, 15, 16 years old. And even those pieces were very short. And I remember how my teacher wanted me to compose a big piano sonata, but I just didn't feel like I wanted to. I wanted to be with people. So subconsciously, you know, your brain kind of compensates with something that you're missing or your teachers are missing, and you still kind of get it from a different source. So I am really, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to have not just required classes, but also, you know, additional classes like compositions that actually helped me to experience ensemble music and help me to experience collaboration with people, because I always like to be surrounded by people and do something with them and not just sit in the practice room, even though I sat in the practice room for many hours, but that would not be the only thing that I really enjoyed. So um, the first time, the first time in my life when, and I had a couple of times when I had to think about ensemble and like, what does it mean? And why do I need it? And do I need it at all? At what age I need it? Like how soon should I introduce it to my students? So I had at least two big moments, I would say, in my professional life when I had to think about that particular area and that particular question. The first time was when I already was in Arizona studying for a master's and then doctorate degree, and I got teaching assistantship, and I taught group piano classes at ASU under Dr. Uh, Madeline Williamson, and she was absolutely a terrific advisor, and she opened my eyes to beginning piano studies, because obviously at that time, I could not even remember how it all started for me. It was such a long way from 6 to 23 or 24 when I came to Arizona that I could not really remember how it all started. But she was the person who uh, introduced all her assistants to teaching material, but she also met with us and she talked with us about how we did things and how we felt about things and how we want to change things maybe, if we could add something or take something away or maybe rearrange it. You know, so we had weekly discussions and that really helped because I know that in many universities, when you teach a class, group piano class, they give you a book 
and you go to the class with a book and then you do with that book whatever you think you should be doing or should not be doing but nobody really asks you how you do it what you do nobody questions you so i really had a mentor for a number of years and i'm very thankful for that opportunity because it really helped to learn things that i did not know or forgot and establish my own style in teaching group piano and obviously it helped me to change the way i taught private students so with uh group piano we introduced group piano uh we introduced ensembles to group piano from the very beginning and they continue doing so with uh, my group piano class at chica state as well in fact we are week nine right now at chica state and we just played our first ensemble i was play i played teacher's part my son's played Prima part, we did orchestration of that ensemble. So I'm doing it right away with students who come to me and some of them don't read music. They just don't know how to read music because we accept students without any background in music to start degree. So um, I'm doing that right away. And that's because I experienced that as a teaching assistant at Arizona State University. And uh, I want to introduce um, a book which I will ask does anyone know this book? It's called The Red Carousel by Elias Davidson. Anybody ever? Okay, so I'm going to play several pieces from this duet. I have a pre-recorded on YouTube. Um, I'm going to do screen sharing. So that book and that composer was um, something that we did at Arizona State University. We played selected pieces from this book, and um, I continued teaching my group piano students duets from this particular set. And there are 18, it says easy piano duets, but I'll let you listen to how easy they are. I mean, they're easy for, you know, pianist who has a doctorate degree. But uh, if you look from the beginner's point, you know, how things are constructed, uh, you may have a different opinion. They're very melodical, but at the same time, Elias Davidson is not uh, scared to use dissonances and interesting combinations of chords with added notes with passing tones so it's classical but it's it doesn't sound like mozart and uh because he uh uses a lot of dances in his duet there are waltzes there are rec times um there are just dances uh there is latin dance here cha 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 so uh, all these pieces have this rhythmic the rhythmic drive and they become very very interesting and energetic and when students play them they all like it like it very very much so i taught this book for about um 20 years on and off and uh one of my students my private student and she was here today so i don't see her right now but uh maybe she'll come back so um she actually studied all duets with me as a part of her pedagogy project, pedagogical certificate at um, Chica State University. And the recording you're going to hear, it's audio, it's not video, unfortunately, but it's audio from the recital, it's live performance. And we performed eight duets together um, on the grand piano in the recital hall in 2018. So that's four years ago. And uh, about Elia Davidson, just to give you some information, uh, he was born in Palestine in 1941. He started um, piano in Vienna and he lived in Iceland for a number of years, became a citizen there. And uh, his last years uh, from 2008 to present, almost present, uh, he lived in Germany. He was born in 41. So, we just Googled him yesterday just to be sure that information is current. Unfortunately, he passed away this spring in uh, April. So he was 81 years old. And that's how this composer looks like when he was probably around 50. He didn't change much. Uh, I looked at some YouTube uh, videos of him. So uh, just looked almost the same 30 years later. But anyway, so I really suggest uh, to look into these pieces uh, because they bring fresh air into standard elementary repertoire for piano for hands. And he says that it's for grades two, three, and four. So students in second, third, fourth year of piano studies can play it. And specifically, he composed both parts. They equally difficult, so or equally easy. You can put it this way. So they can be performed by both students. 
So not necessarily a teaching student, but you can have two students playing two parts. And this is what I was doing in my group piano classes. So I'm going to share, start sharing. Um, their sound, right, absolutely right. Okay, so that's the recording. That's Leah and me after the recital. But unfortunately, there is no um, visual, so it's only um, sound. So um, the first piece you're gonna hear is called Mirta. And Mirta was one of the two wives of Socrates in um, ancient Greece. And this particular piece, it deals with different types of articulation. Um, there are accents, staccatos, legatos, everything changes every single minute. And of course, the question of balance because hands are very close and uh, the melody still has to stand out. So let's hear it. One time. The second piece is called Yiddish Wedding, and it's very slow. And as with any slow ensemble piece, the main difficulty is to stay together because it's very easy to miss a quarter of a beat and it shows very, very clearly. It has to deal with big dynamic range. There are also rests that need to be observed and there are contrasts. The next piece is Icelandic dance. And let me actually ask you, can you hear me when I talk right now? Yeah, because I'm starting this, but I'm not exiting screen sharing. I want to make sure that everything I say is still heard. Okay, excellent. So the next third piece on this recording is Icelandic dance. And it's a very interesting um, how he chooses uh, to give the melody in the prima part. 
it's in parallel force, not in thirds, not in six, like it's typical for classical music, but in the interval of the force. So it gives a very interesting flavor melodically. And um, there are three main sections here, and first one in, in F, second in A major, and the third one back in F. So here is this uh, tertiary relationship between the uh, sections which bring freshness to the sound as well. It's a fast piece, very energetic, a lot of staccatos, a lot of crescendos, very fast crescendos, like in one or two measures, the sound gets very loud and um, kind of makes you want to dance when you hear it. The fourth piece is Paris 1930. And of course, when you think about Paris, you probably think about the dance, and the dance is the waltz. So it is the waltz. And um, main articulation here is the gata, very nice singing melody in the prima part in the right hand with accompaniment in the left hand, which imitates accordion, I think, to a certain extent. And uh, melodically, it's really beautiful melody, but it does have some dissonances, which fit very nicely with how the harmonies are used as well. And uh, the overall form is ternary, like in most of the pieces he composes. And it's uh, a larger piece. Um, and the Question of balance between hands and different parts is also very important here. The next piece is called In the Land of Ants. He has very interesting titles sometimes. I don't think I want to be in the land of ants personally, but clearly it exists somewhere. And uh, you can feel this crawling motion of the insects when you hear the piece. Uh, it's very busy and it's uh, quite dissonant at times because um, I think it describes the nature of the insects. And it's very interesting how he uses um, how he uses the melody. It's not given to prima part only, it travels between prima and seconda. So in the beginning of the piece, the melody is in prima part and in the middle section, which is in the minor key, it's in seconda. Just listen to that you know, change of the register and also traveling of the theme. And then it comes back in a prime section, again, ternary form, right? It comes back in the prima part. Thank you. 
makes me smile when I listen to it each time, even though I heard it many times in my life. Uh, the next one is Chicago 1922, 100 years ago, looks like. Um, so, and it has subtitle Al Capone Territory. So he tries to describe describe mafia here just a little bit. So a dissonant piece uh, with a swing, which was typical for that uh, era. There are many parallel sevens in this piece, but they all fit nice and they all resolve in the key and it gives you kind of a pleasant feeling. So for this one, counting, it's very important uh, rests, observing the rest, accents, syncopations. So definitely students have to have a good sense of rhythm or here's a chance to develop that particular sense of rhythm and precision while learning that piece. Next selection is Divers Rep Time. And this particular piece can be played by very, very beginners if teacher plays the second part. And if that's not the case, then clearly it should be students of two different levels. Because the prima part is in five finger position, it doesn't exceed anything. You have to count, obviously, because it's a rep time. But uh, second part is chromatic, it has more, you know, moving ports and moving positions, and it requires more different types of articulation and more response to dynamics. So um, clearly, if it's performed by two students, it should be two different type of students, beginner and maybe you know, beginner with a couple of years of experience, at least one year of experience. And of course, it's uh, fast, tempo will depend on you know, students' abilities, can be probably played slightly slower, but we look at, uh, at a faster rate with the yeah. The last two pieces are Red Carousel and Cha Cha Cha. So the Red Carousel is the title of the book and that's the piece in the book as well. It's another waltz. It says Tempo di Valse, so in the tempo of waltz. And uh, it does have this melodic specifics as well, like all of his pieces, there are minor seconds here and there. 
But uh, while listening to this piece, you can clearly hear circle motion, how the merry-go-round circles around and do, does all the spins. It's really very well depicted in the music. And the last piece will be Cha Cha Cha, which is a Latin ballroom dance. And um, this is probably one of the hardest pieces in this set because it deals with hand crossings, it deals with sudden contrasts. Dynamic range goes from pianissimo to fortissimo, so it's something that needs to be very clearly done. And there are many, many contrasts to just go from piano to fortissimo in two measures or less. Articulation, all types are presented. There are slurs, so there are strigata, there are staccato notes, there are accents, different types of accents, more or less. And um, it's really a fun piece to play if you can coordinate all these little details together with uh, your partner. So a red carousel and cha-cha-cha. Okay, so this was the eight pieces we played in recital, and I'm just curious, what do you think about this music? If uh, maybe several of you want to say something about what you just heard, uh, keeping in mind that this is recommended for beginners, piano beginners. And after listening to the last piece, uh, you need to have a very, very good beginner to play this piece, definitely. That's my personal opinion, but I'm curious to know what you think. Well, I'll go ahead and say something, but while other people want to chime in, I just, it's like you said, I loved that it wasn't always, you know, the expected Western harmonies that, that I think a lot of our students come in with the preconceptions mm -hmm. of. And so some of those harmonies were so nice and so yes. interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a melodic aspect of it, but it's very well structured. I think it's very easy to understand. It's very square, you know, most of the times it's eight measure phrase, you know, and then another eight measure phrase, but you don't notice it so much because attention is on the sound. And I think he really pays great attention to, you know, all the details and uh, articulation would be the other area. He's very 
you know, particular about how things are articulated. And if you do all of those staccatos and legatos and slurs and accents and half accents and whatever, plus the melody, it just creates a very different image from what we used to, you know, hear when we hear elementary students play an elementary type duet. I mean, that's my you know, personal take on it. But I'm, I'm curious if anybody has anything else to, uh, to say because I'm hearing this music for many years. And you understand when you do that, you kind of get used to what you hear, um, but you hear it first time. So first experience really matters, I think. Mm, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, Barb. I think they're charming. Um, they're very diverse um, and they're very concentrated. So in a very short piece, you get a lot of um, different characteristics. And what I love is the, um that this set you can use it to expose even the very young beginner to things like jazz and blues and the one with all the fourths it seems very um very reminiscent of, of bar talk to me mm -hmm. so you can discuss a lot of different um styles of music and also the rhythmic vitality of some of these i think is just really really the ants um is just very, very interesting. So I, yeah, I think they're charming. I absolutely agree with you. With the ants, what you heard is hemiola. So it is there. I didn't want to use that word because you know you don't teach beginners that right away, but uh, you teach them how to play it and then they will see it and understand. But yes, so even though it's in 4-4, but it's really not <laughs> because of how things are grouped. And if you bring out that rhythmical aspect, yes, that's exactly what you get. But yeah, very good. You heard that. Okay, um, Shirin, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say that um, based on what I heard, it also sounds like it doesn't have that much octaves where it would be suitable for little kids to, um, you know, not have to um, stretch their hands too much in one hand, you know. So, no, very close, very close. It's in, you know, in six and thirds and fourths, right. one octave apart, but hands very close. So the person who plays prima and the person who plays seconda, you really need, I would say, four and a half octaves total for any piece. And some even less, three and a half. So it's really fitting little students because they're small, they will sit next to each other, they're not going to feel like they're crowded. And they're only going to use that, that little space. And that, you know, feeling close, it kind of helps you to feel secure as well, you know, rather than being far apart. Yes, absolutely right. I have Leah here. She just came back and Leah played with me. So, um, Leah, do you remember this project? Remember how we practiced for it and how it went? Do you want it's, to contribute yeah. your perspective, please? Yes, it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Leah. Um, I'm multitasking today. I'm on a hike out here. Um, That's fine. I have some family visiting, so they wanted to go for a hike. So I don't know if I can be on much longer. But anyway, I was really honored to be a part of this and to listen. Um, of course, I'm hypercritical of how I played everything, listening back. <laughs> but, That's normal. Yes. And I really think that Dr. Shkoda carry the piece that she really helped the I, I really admire her playing and it just sounds like each note that she plays it has its own life its own world and that's something I really admire um and I and I I got a late start by the way as a pianist um I didn't study I didn't start practicing classical music until I met her so um I had some musical background but I was a beginner so I feel like this book was a good level for me and I like how the pieces take you out of your comfort zone and it's um it's like when you want to learn to draw you you don't it helps to, to draw something upside down so you're not like literally focusing on what you think it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, it was like that learning these pieces. It was not like the music wasn't what I was expecting. I just had to focus on the technique and um, learn something that I didn't really know what it was going to sound like until. Leah, you cut it off, unfortunately. I hope she will be able to come back. But as she said, she is hiking. So, uh, 
I think it was a really enjoyable project for both of us to do together at that time. So uh, I think you did a great job learning them and especially learning the whole book because you know all of the pieces and writing that paper about all of them. I think that was a big achievement. Uh, and as a teacher, you know, future, future teacher, you can use that later with your little students and I hope you will. Thank you. So Were you able to hear me? I don't know if the service cut out. Yes, it did. It did. Sorry about that. Um, I hope you heard some of it. <laughs> yes, yes, we did. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that was uh, basically first part of what I wanted to talk about today. Like first time when I thought again about piano ensemble and that's what I came up with. Just finding repertoire that is not something that I knew about and it's not strictly classical but uh, can be used at the very early stage of piano playing and teaches a lot of different songs right away, but also has all this dance orientation and it's just very attractive musically and structurally to students. Um, second moment in my life when I started thinking again about what to do with ensembles, how much, how little, what types, was the time when I started teaching piano to my daughter, April. And she was four at the time, so it's, um, very young age, as you all would agree. And um, I wanted to do things differently with her. You know, by that time, I taught piano for almost 30 years. So I had really big experience and I've done different types of things. You know, I had uh, students, you know, being five or six or seven winning competitions under my guidance was just one year of private instruction. So I had students who were doing programs. I had students who were accepted into colleges and universities across the nation. I was a professor already at uh, Chico State, associate professor at that time, going into full. So um, I had uh, all kinds of, you know, things I could experiment with and I had time to do that. So when I had my own child, uh, I wanted to do the best possible, you know, given that she's interested. And I was waiting a little bit for her to be able to sit, you know, for 10 minutes still before we can start, you know, because she showed interest from the very beginning, but she couldn't sit. So we had to wait until April can sit. And that time happened when she was four. and. Um, I had a few things in mind that I wanted to change compared to how things were done, you know, when I taught before. So for once, I wanted to postpone notation for some period of time, learning notation. I gave her name of the notes, she knew them right away. Uh, we used, uh, you know, do re mi fa sol system, we didn't use C, D, E, F, G at first. She knows both systems now, of course, but uh, we started with the ones that is just used for sight singing. And uh, I explained all kinds of structures to her. I gave names for chords right away, for intervals, she knew all of that. But I wanted to wait with uh, introducing formal notation and making her learn that that's how G looks like, that's how C looks like. Uh, I did teach her how to count and I did a lot of uh, rhythmical exercises involving body motion. Um, that can get, she can actually count while clapping, while tapping, while jumping, while doing all kinds of things. So she could feel rhythm very well because for to play ensemble, you need to be able to coordinate things well. And uh, that was very helpful. But I waited with notation. And um, also, I wanted her to play the pieces that she really liked, that were appropriate for her at that time when she started something that she could sing and relate to. Um, I remember that in my own education, every time I wanted to play something that uh, I wanted, you know, a song from the you know movie or from cartoon or something that I heard on the street, I was always told you go and do it yourself. So nobody would ever try to help me with that. Like spend three minutes explaining how that melody would go and how you would use you know accompaniment in your left hand. I realized way later, you know, well, that's probably that probably happened because again, it wasn't the focus of building a soloist, but also because those teachers themselves probably didn't know how to do it. Because when we don't feel comfortable with something, we just uh, give it to a student and say, you know, you're smart enough, you go and figure it out. What does that actually mean? I mean, will that student figure it out or will he just drop <laughs> that desire and never come back to it? Or will he have to wait 30 years, like in my case, to figure out whether or not I can actually do it? So with, with my daughter, so I wanted her not to be overwhelmed with reading music right away at age four, but I wanted her to play quality material and something she can relate to. 
and sometimes she would like and she would know and be able to sing along as she would play. And uh, we have um, 10 little videos today. I don't know if we can go over all of them, but we'll pick and choose. I'll show you several examples. So in the first year and a half of April studies, uh, we took combined approach. There were some books we used for ensemble pieces, and that was driven by um, some kind of performance event in which she participated. So when she was doing her current editions, uh, uh, Sacramento chapter in 2020, she had to prepare a piece from the book of duets. Uh, so she learned the duet from that book. And then we just like something else from the book. So we learned another duet from that book. But uh, there were also projects that just were driven by wanting to play that particular piece. And there was no book. So I improvised both parts and I taught April to play her part by ear and I provided accompaniment. And we tried to be creative with this. And sometimes we were creating like a little uh, movie. So in the first video, you're going to see uh, that uh, we have her first ensemble and it's called Dog's Waltz. A video is in Russian, but you will understand what's going on because we make videos in all languages. So April speaks four languages. Um, she's learning the fourth language. So we make videos in Russian, in Ukrainian, in English, and in Spanish. So uh, some of them have, uh, no. but uh, musical part is still the same. So music is music. So uh, in that particular video, she sings a song about her dogs. You will see lots of dogs in the video. And then she plays her part by herself, and then I play an ensemble with her. So it's a very short video, it takes two minutes, all of it. But I just want to show you what can be done uh, creatively if teacher has time, of course, and desire and connection with the student. And um, it's just you know one of the examples of what we did together. And that particular ensemble, uh, we made it when April played piano for uh, seven weeks, one and a half months. Okay, not this one. We need to move to a different, just one second. We're gonna to move to a different video. video. Okay. Yes, it is here, wonderful. Сегодня 23 августа 2020 года, April 4 года и 4 месяца. Она играет на фортепиано около 7 недель. И сегодня мы будем записывать новое произведение, которое называется... То есть сначала April нам споет про своих собак.
the three parts, as I said, she named her dogs, all of the dogs, and she created the lyrics for that particular video. And then she sang the melody using the Remi Fasol. And then third time around, we played this. And as you could see, rhythmical structure was there. She followed very well um, the rhythm and the counting and clearly enjoyed the project. The next video I'm going to show, it's in Ukrainian. It's a Ukrainian song, Ukrainian folk song. So clearly there was no book uh, for that. And it was something that uh, the lullaby, very good for lullaby, and we learned it first, and uh, she wanted to play it. There are three verses, and I created a little ensemble for that particular piece, and um, each verse is different. In the first verse, it's just accompaniment. We're both using left hands when we play and sing alone. In the second verse, uh, you play melody, plays melody in the right hand, and I accompany her. And then in the third verse, you play melody in the left hand mm -hmm. and I accompany you in the high register, right? So what did that piece teach you? Legato. Legato. So, it was a, so as you could see, first piece, every time I had duet in mind, I wanted something to be learned. So the first articulation is non-legato. That's how you start a student. So dog's waltz was non-legato and tetrachord position. And then the next ensemble I created, it took her further with articulation and was using all five fingers. So five finger position, in uh, each hand, still hands separately because she could not coordinate hands together as of, as of that particular moment. But uh, legata, which is a different touch and requires you know, different uh, attitude with that. And singing as a part of ensemble is something that I try to incorporate with April since the very beginning because it helps with producing a proper sound. As we all know, piano is a percussive type of instrument and many times we have students who just really bang on the piano, especially at the early age. If they're not afraid, they're just gonna play very loudly and you have to work with that sound. So singing really helps to start listening to how your fingers move and what kind of sound you produce. So I'm going to screen share that second video, this Ukrainian lullaby, and uh, you can see that texture is very transparent. It's not really for four hands, because we're using two hands at each time. I use one hand and everyone uses one hand, just to make texture you know, very transparent so you can hear some singing. Сереж, подойди, я потеряла. I'm searching for the file. I understand. Here is YouTube. Okay, we're here. Thank you. 
So that video was made when April played two and a half months. And the next step was to bring her to play in hand with hands together. And we made a video. All the pretty little horses. Right. So what did you learn from it? Our hands together in the garden. Right. And we your position. Yeah, your position was, was extended from um five note positions to almost the scale. So you don't scale fingers. And in ensembles, usually you have a prima part sitting on the right side and seconda part sitting on the left side, right? So the hands are like this, hold it like this, right? And what we did, and it looks like it's my favorite way of using hands when I create ensembles is this. So I'm my hands are around students' hands. And it means you have two left hands on one side and two right hands on this Instead side. Of so I can add sound on both ends of the piano and that creates a fuller sound overall. And she's still centered in the centered at the piano. She's in the middle because one of the typical ensemble issues with you know classical ensembles, student plays in a high register, high notes, and it's very hard to play them louder than the accompanying notes. So students has to constantly deal with this high register, which by itself is very soft. And uh, my take on this was to place her in the middle register so she deals with the notes that have, you know, fuller sound and you can hear them easily. And obviously I can deal with balance and I can soften right hand or left hand depending on what we need. So in one way I'm adding sound, in the other way I'm creating a better balance situation for the ensemble when I you know, improvise my ensembles. So all the pretty little horses, that's um, American lullaby. And we're just doing one verse of uh, it. And I'm going to screen share this video with you in a moment. is October 17th, 2020. We're gonna play a uh, lullaby, Hushabye Don't You Cry, as ensemble. We're gonna use vibraphone and strings on the piano, and we're gonna do it with uh, four hands. One, two, Okay, so as the next step in ensemble direction, we had a project which was uh, additions, piano additions, uh, statewide uh, project, which um, eventually led to a festival in California. And for that project, April needed to prepare two solo pieces and one ensemble piece. And we had to use a book in this particular case. And I'm gonna show the book. I don't know if you use this in your teaching or not. It's by Lancaster and Pologic. Uh, family, right? And uh, they just compiled classical piano duets. There is book one and two. This one is two, but there is one that's even simpler than them. this. It's elementary, uh, 17 elementary duets, and it's a wonderful compilation of books. They're really good sounding. And what I like about this, I have information about this composers that are not primary composers, you know, but they're very important in their own time. So you can actually educate yourself about uh, who Francois Grimaldi was because it's not the name that comes to my mind right away. And I can't talk about him without uh, having some support, but uh, so it gives you less known composers, but very nicely sounding pieces. And Lancaster and Kovacic, they edited this book and put it all together. And they have a series of books like this, two for um, uh, elementary level, two for uh, intermediate level, 
And uh, obviously, there are also ensembles in group piano books that they wrote, and I'm using them sometimes as well. So that uh, next video I'm going to share with you, uh, we recorded when April was four months, uh, was studying piano for four months. And uh, it's a traditional, you know, uh, piece from uh, from the book. So we were started learning notation a little bit at that time. And what did you learn from this particular piece? It's Allegro, right? Allegro yeah. by balance. Yeah. Okay. So what the hardest you... part was balance. Yes. So the hardest part was balance, as I mentioned, because prima part is placed in a very high register, and there are many notes in the second part, and little fingers have to balance out the sound against somebody who plays piano for 40 years. So it's not really a fair game, but you know, that's that's what it is. How about articulation? What kind of articulation you had? There? Legato. All articulation. All articulation. Legato is staccato and new part was accents. Yes, and you learned accents in this piece, yes. And did you learn it uh, reading the music or by ear? Both. Both. So we use combined method because certain songs were easier to learn when you hear. Uh, but I also started, uh, you know, pushing towards learning notation a little bit. And uh, at least sometimes, you know, you can learn notation afterwards. You play the notes and then you already know the notes. You look back at how they look like in the score. And that's also a good method to learn because you already know where they are. And then you kind of confirm the fact that they are here on the piano, but that's how they look in the score. So I kind of did it a little bit backwards, but as a result was still to know where you are in the score at the end. So I'm going to share this. Uh, next video with you, uh, Barons Allegria. April Smirnov, four years old, California Association of Professional Music Teachers, Piano Editions, Herman Behrens, Allegra. <laughs> The next project that we're going to show you um, was done in March 2021. And by that time, April played piano for seven and a half months. And it was a traditional uh, ensemble piece from the same book, but the piece was longer. And it taught uh, a new time signature to April. What was that? Six, eight. Six, eight, right. And the piece is called Romance. It was also in a five finger position for both hands. And um, it had to deal with legata, with shaping phrases. So we started paying more attention to the sound of it. It didn't involve any singing, but uh, we just did the piece because we liked it, right? So let's hear it. Hi, March 10, 2021. Unicat duo playing romance by Heinrich Enke for piano for hands. April Smirnov Prima, Natalia Shkoda, Seconda.
the next project was our family project. Um, I created ensemble for five hands. I, um, my husband played piano was when he was a child and we had a special occasion, you know, our occasion, family occasion. Our kid was turning seven years old and we decided to dedicate the song to our kid. We used Amazing Grace tune, but we changed it to Amazing Cat instead of Amazing Grace. And we just used first verse. And we made a video in which April played Amazing Grace tune from this book. I don't know if you're aware of this. I bought the book because I really like how the piano looks like. But it has a great compilation of tunes, about 40 different songs that uh, you know, every kid should know, really, music or not music. And uh, there was Amazing Grace here uh, in um, solo version. So April played that. And I added accompaniment. And again, she was in the middle. My hands were around her with accompaniment. And my husband's hands, he was on the top register, doubling the melody. So it was ensemble for five kids uh, oh, for, for five hands and dedicated to this you know, special occasion of our kids' birthday. So I'm just talking about you know, creativity. It can take different forms. You can find inspiration in almost anything in your daily life. And it can be the pet that you like. At, at least it happened you know, in our case. So I'm going to screen share with you that particular ensemble for three performers, five hands. Hi, today is September 14, 2021. This is our cat, Shine. He turned seven years old on September 1 of this year. We adopted Shine when he was almost two, and this is how he looked like five years ago. Before us, he had two different owners and two different names. At first, he was called Winky, and then he was called Whiskers. But we all really think that his real name is Shine, and that's the name he's gonna keep until the rest of his days. For Shine's birthday, we created a song using Amazing Grace music, we created lyrics, and we arranged the song for piano ensemble for five hands. And we want you to enjoy our creation. The next ensemble uh, will be arrangement of a Christmas tune. I used um, this book, it's just a collection of Christmas songs that all of us know, or most of us know. It's 100 of them. I probably don't know 100, but definitely know at least half of them. And um, I bought this book many years ago, and uh, we have a project at Chica State, a concert that is dedicated to Christmas, and uh, we perform faculty and students perform in December. There are three concerts and uh, we play three times for the audience and the money that we get from the concerts go to student scholarships. And the specific you know, subject of that recital is Christmas. So uh, many times my students could use uh, you know, solo version of a piece and play it in that particular recital. So that was the reason why I got the 
But then I started thinking that any of those ensemble pieces can be actually created, uh, any of those solo pieces can be rearranged as an ensemble. And I took one of the pieces from that book, I'll Be Home for Christmas. And that was the song that I was singing to April from the very, very beginning when she just, you know, was born. And the first Christmas she had, you know, that was the song I, you know, she heard it all her life. But uh, that was the time that um, I decided to create an ensemble and rearrange whatever the book gave me into uh, melody and accompaniment. There are two verses, as you know, in this piece, and I did them differently in terms of how uh, April Spark looked like. And what was the new technique you learned there? Then? Tremolo. Tremolo. We tried to you know, elaborate a little bit, and we used instrumentation again, because we're using digital piano for the project, so we could experiment with the sound. So I'm going to share that video with you in a moment. December 23, 2021, Unikiat Piano Do, April Smirnoff, Natalia Škoda, I'll be home for Christmas. <laughs> And the last ensemble I'm gonna show you today is Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. It was one of the first pieces April learned when she started playing piano. She learned it as a solo version. And then in March of 2022, we started learning Spanish as a family. We decided to take this project and just start adding another language. And uh, I got several books for April with songs, bilingual books in both English and Spanish. And if any of you think about introducing Spanish to your life uh, musically, that is a really great series in my opinions. Um, Coca is a dog, she learns Spanish, but uh, she also sings in English. So um, we took Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and the purpose was to learn it in Spanish, of course, but we use the tune that April already knew, bless you. And uh, I created a little ensemble, you know, I added just um, accompaniment in one hand uh, on top of it that would resemble stars. And uh, because it's a bilingual song, she could do it in both English and Spanish, I decided to start introducing transposition skills into April's piano studies. So she plays and sings the song twice. I provide accompaniment, but she does it in two different keys. So it's just, you know, I want to show you a connection between different things. So when I teach ensemble, I try to incorporate singing into that, but also transposition skills and some other skills. So it all kind of comes together as a project that teaches you things other than playing solo. 
and practicing you know, many, many hours until you get no wrong notes whatsoever, but that's really the only thing you can do. And then they ask you to play it from a different note and you can't you know, because that's really what happens when you just focus too much on one activity. So I'm gonna screen uh, share that last video with you and then we'll be ready to take any questions um, or ideas that you may have or just reflections and have some, some kind of chat to conclude this session. Yes, so um, one could put a little star, which in Spanish sounds as Estrellita on the stars. And Espanol de Señorita y Pro y Señora Natalia. Canción número uno. Estrellita, ¿dónde estás? So that last video was made when April was still five years old. It's March 2022 this year. She turned six in April and she played piano for a year and eight months at that time. Okay, and by that time, you know, she could do things with both hands. She had formal uh, ensembles. She could read music. Uh, she could transpose. And we continue with the transition project. We use chair to transpose, but we started that with ensembles. And it was a very good start, you know, to transpose something that you really like and want to hear from different notes in the piano. So um, my conclusion, you know, from all of this, you know, so far where I stand with uh, piano ensemble in my life and in the life of my students, definitely it's something that should be introduced as early as possible. Um, Teachers can use books, of course, because there are some really wonderful books, but uh, especially for younger students and for students who may be a little bit reluctant to read music, uh, teachers can um, improvise ensembles and uh, create you know, something just for them and the student, uh, depending of course on how much time teacher has and how much we're well, willing to spend with a student, particular student, to uh, make development uh, go further. And um, clearly there are some students that are maybe you know, less competitive than the others, and they would really thrive in the environment of playing ensemble music for you know, a number of years, because chamber music or any ensemble music, it doesn't require memorization. Right, uh, you feel supported by the sound of the person who plays next to you, so you don't feel alone. Right, practice is really fun because you have you know somebody else to talk to you while you practice and things. And with the technology, things became a little bit easier. I think compared to how I started when I was little, there was really no digital piano inside or a YouTube or any kind of you know technical support. But right now, with everything we have, uh, again, it comes to time how much time we want to and can spend. But uh, we. Can can pre-record parts and let students go and practice at home with pre-recorded parts and uh, also use instrumentation like I showed you in some of the ensembles we used uh, so it doesn't sound just piano but sounds like you're playing with the orchestra and it just creates um, you know develops imagination and creates a different 
sounds that can be very attractive. And in any case, I think it's just a lifelong skill that can help to build relationship with a student and become a little bit closer and um, definitely fun for all involved if it's done properly and with design both sides. So I'm uh, open to take, we are open to take any questions from you or comments. And if we're able to answer them, we will answer them. Anybody? If you don't have questions for us, um, maybe I can ask, um, do you teach ensemble music to your students? And if uh, yes, what kind of music and what are your thoughts on this topic? Oh, I want to make a comment. I really appreciate um, Natalia um, for sharing all these videos, doing ensemble uh, with your daughter, April. And, um, you know, if, based on the videos, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to see how uh, you guys dress alike and you play music together and, and your daughter really enjoys um, playing with, with mom together. Yeah, she does. She does. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to have like a mother-daughter bonding kind of a yeah. thing. But that also relates to how, you know, a teacher and a student can bond together playing ensemble music together because this is something I do implement to all of my students at the studio. Um, and I also encourage my um, teachers, my staff that works over at my studio to also do the same thing with their students because it does spark their interest more. And I really like the idea of using a digital piano and changing the sounds because it really creates their imagination, things like that, because that's something I also do at this mm -hmm. as well. And, Excellent. Uh, and uh, just, you know, I, I feel like I can relate to what you what you do and um and i feel like i am on the right track because that's what you do too <laughs> <laughs> thank you Shireen. very nice of you <laughs> absolutely absolutely and again it, it really depends you know on teachers experience teachers qualifications uh i did have a number of years of composing music in my life i don't do it anymore but um uh, since I started doing this project, ensemble music, I do keep like on the back of my mind an idea that maybe at some point when I retire from Chico State, you know, I can actually notate it and make a book because by that time I'm probably going to have 50 different ensembles. So I don't have, I didn't notate any of this. Okay, they exist as YouTube videos and that's all. And I remember them because we keep, you know, everything, you know, we just, uh, like last week of the month, we review everything that they played so far, so including these ensembles. So it's we can play them at any time if we want to, but there is no book, you know, as such. So maybe one day, you know, this all will turn into me producing a book of all of these pieces that don't exist otherwise, you know. And again, that's another idea for you know for teachers, you know, again because you know we teach and we kind of think that you know that's all we're gonna do for the rest of our lives. Uh, not necessarily, you know, things may change. And one thing I really uh, discovered for myself is that teachers constantly need inspiration. We as teachers, we need inspiration. You know, it doesn't end with a doctorate degree. So we finish our doctorate degree or master's degree or whatever studies, you know, we get really inspired to doing all of that. And then we start teaching, we're inspired when we start teaching. This. But then after a number of years, it just becomes a routine. So we constantly need something that sparkles our interest in teaching and maybe shifts our focus from one thing to another thing and um, helps us to develop, you know, in a sense, you know, as uh, pedagogues and as uh, people as well. And for me, you know, teaching my own daughter was a great moment, inspirational moment, because I had to, I wanted to do it differently. Okay, I had all kinds of things that I've already done and on my resume, but uh, I wanted to take a different approach and see where it's going to go. 
Barbara, how about you? How do you teach ensembles? How often, maybe? Like, do you have any recitals with ensembles for your students? Um, yeah, I use ensemble um, from the very first lesson, the very, very beginning. Um, I'm always playing with students, you know, a duet part that I just improvise. And I also um, love Natalia, all of the singing that you do, because we know how natural that is for a child. Singing is just innate. Um, and to do that from the very beginning is just so, so beautiful to see. We are constantly singing in my studio and um, I, I feel it's very important. So I, I really appreciate seeing that. Thank you. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And you could feel how April seen and developed in a year and a half. She was barely, you know, saying something when you watch the first video. And then the last one was only a year and a half apart. I wasn't even singing anymore because she didn't need any support. You know, so at some point I just stopped singing. Not that I don't want to, but I want her to be on the tape. And uh, she felt comfortable enough to do it by herself while playing. And that's, you know, different skill you know it's not something that is uh coming naturally to every single student but i think if we introduce it in teaching and if we reinforce it and do it often enough then it becomes a natural thing carolie how about you yeah um i i do we on occasion we'll have like a a, a duet recital in the studio mm -hmm where each one is assigned to play with the teacher. And I mean, it's it's a lot easier to do ensemble works. I think in, in the beginning, the beginning stages where there's a lot of music written for, you know, a simple melody and a teacher accompaniment. And so there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of that, but I, I do love when, when the older students are able to rediscover the joy of playing with somebody else. And mm -hmm. when there's two students that are on pretty equal footing of, of experience or inexperience, they learn so much from each other and they're able to kind of just like laugh off their mistakes. And, but also, you know, the end result sounds so much better than what most of their solos are able to do on their own. So those duet recitals, they're a kind of a pain to put together sometimes with the rehearsals, but they're always so worth it at the end because there's just so much joy and, and fun that they find in the music. Yeah, they're very time required uh, consuming projects and some books because as a teacher you have to hear both parts and students don't realize that, that it's really twice as much work because it's not just one student with mistakes, but it's two. <laughs> You know, yeah. and we have to address all of that and also they don't have our ears or our perception of how we hear things and how we want things to be done. So it takes um, a long time, you know, to explain to them what is that we're actually hearing and why we want things to be done this and this way and not that and that. But you're absolutely right. Collaboration is, you know, one of the things um, that um, cannot be not noticed. You know, it's it's there. And when I teach um, ensembles in my group piano class, I have adult students and who, as I said, you know, come to Chico State very often without any experience with music. So after uh, um, it's level two, so I teach those ensembles in second semester of group piano studies. So what they have maybe about uh, five, six months of group studies with me before they get that project. And, um, you know, it's not, it's very little time, but those projects never fail. I can tell you this much, you know, there could be other tests and students can do them differently on those tests, but this specific ensemble project, which I use as a final project for the class, doesn't matter, you know, what level of the student is, but for that project, because I have this peer pressure and because uh, they like the music, how it sounds, and this whole experience is, you know, talking to somebody when you're playing, right? There are no failing grades. I mean, I never had in a uh, 14 years of teaching I never had a single failing ensemble it just it's just a miracle I think I mean the levels are different you know some are really brilliant some are you know acceptable but you know acceptable that's important yeah that's for the teacher that's, that's fantastic yeah exactly exactly well, we want to thank you so much for this class today. And thank you so much for your helper. Thank you, April, for being here. You're welcome. Say, you're thank welcome. you. You are very, very welcome. We're happy to be here. And um, I hope we can do you know, another presentation sometime in the future, once we have a different topic to talk and discuss. 
Thank you all very, very much. It was very enjoyable. And again, I want to thank Radmila and Jessica. They're not here today. I know they have reasons for that, but I'm very appreciative of their help in organizing this. And it's just really wonderful to see the faces I saw when I came as a student to Arizona State, Barb, Shireen. It's really nice to see you again you know, after so many years and uh, know that you are active and you are teaching. That's fantastic. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you. And thank you all for being here today. We'll awesome. see you at our next meeting and our next masterclass. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you.